Okay, welcome, welcome to the third paint class. Um, so it's it's every Sunday, 7 to 10 Eastern Standard Time. And uh, this Sunday, as you can see by the reference material here, we're going to be painting a tulip. This particular tulip happens to be from a, uh, a, a painting that I've made. Um, so we're not going to use these colors, but uh, we will use this shape. And we're going to be painting the tulip here. This is a kind of uh, paper, a canvas paper. I'll just show you what that looks like. I'll show you what that looks like. That's uh, This is a, a pad of paper. Canson is the maker. Uh, oil and acrylic. You get 24 pages for about 10 bucks. And um, I'll just show you what the texture looks like. If I can get the, there we go. Um, yeah, so it's, it is paper, but it kind of has a texture of, uh, of gessoed canvas. So pretty good to work on. And it's a really nice, inexpensive option if you're dealing with, um, you know, you just want to do some studies or so on. You don't want to use a whole canvas that might be seven or eight or, or 10 bucks. Anyway, 24 sheets for about 10 bucks. I highly recommend it, Canson. And uh, yeah, so that's what we're painting on today. This is uh, nine inches across and 12 inches um, from top to bottom. That's roughly 23 by 30 centimeters for my uh, European friends. And on this side, we have some wax paper and we're gonna be putting our paint on this side. We're gonna have a sort of a running palette, so. Got the palette, the painting, and then the reference material here. Let's see how this setup works. Uh, so to get started, let's just uh, start working on the colors. We're gonna go with raw sienna. Raw sienna is a brown. Now there are basically two kinds of browns when it comes to oil painting. There are the siennas and the umbers. And the sien siennas are the redder browns. So. Um, we're going to use this raw sienna to tone the canvas. Basically, the idea is that we want to get rid of all of the white and uh, just start with a a toned canvas that has a so in um, in painting you have something called value and value is the is the measure of um, if you look if you look at a color as a gray how what gray would it be? Would it be light gray, middle gray, or dark gray? So it's a scale basically from white to, to, to black. That's, that's the value scale. Um, and so when you start a canvas, you want to start with a mid value. So basically a, a, a middle gray, not light. The reason why you don't want to start with white is that the white of the background will mess with your, um, with your optical sense of value. So when you're painting, something uh, it will appear too dark next to a white background and then so you overcompensate and then you, you know you get your values all messed up uh, definitely suboptimal so that's what we do i'm going to be going with a sienna to tone the canvas you can do an umber if you have one a van dyke brown um, you know even rembrandt use sap green uh, anything that will give that canvas a kind of a mid-tone historically and typically what you would do is a brown uh, for organic subjects like flowers, fruit, and people. If you uh, tone the canvas with a blue, your your uh, some of that could come through and make your subjects a little cooler than you would potentially like. So let's get this sienna down first, and then we'll talk about the rest of the colors, the rest of the palette. And uh, to paint this sienna, I'm going to be going with the. Uh, just a large brush here. This is a, what, a 24? Yeah, this is a 24. You can, if you don't have a big brush, that's not a problem. What you uh, what you wanna do is don't put the, the uh, paint, when you're toning a canvas, you want it to tone it with very thin paint. That's much too thick. So you can dip your, can your brush into either paint thinner, if you have it, or turpentine or turpenoid or odorless mineral spirits or even linseed oil. I'm just going with a straight linseed oil here just to avoid using spirits in this very confined space that I'm 
that I find myself painting in. I'm getting uh, this very thin paint on both sides of the brush. And uh, the object is to just cover the whole surface with a thin layer of paint. And I'm sort of scrubbing it on at this point. The reason is, is that this, uh, this paper, which is you know canvas paper, has a texture of canvas, has a lot of bumps. So I, I really want to make sure that I get paint on, on both sides of the bumps. After we finish toning the canvas, we, uh, we're going to be doing a, our drawing of the uh, of the tulip. By the way, uh, this is a paint class, so hopefully you guys are painting along with me. Uh, if not, that you know that's that's totally cool. But um, if you are painting along with me and I move on to the next step or go too quickly and you're not quite ready, just drop me a comment and I'm happy to uh, just put a pause on the painting and uh, you know, ramble for a little bit and until you, you are finished with that step. So uh, if, you, if you are painting, I don't want to move on to a step if you're not ready. And uh, we have three hours scheduled for tonight. But uh, I don't think this tulip will take three hours. But uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how long it takes. Anyway, it's not a problem for me to pause at all. I'm just covering the whole canvas now with this thin layer, this transparent layer. And uh, where you have, you can see your brush strokes. Just try to brush those out by going all the way up to the top, all the way down. And just blend those brush strokes in. You can go side to side and avoid this kind of thing at this stage. You're gonna get a lot of marks and streaks. So you just go all the way across. or all the way up and all the way down. You don't have to completely blend everything in. It's okay if there's a little bit of inconsistency. We're going to be painting over this entire area, so nothing needs to uh, stay perfect at this point. I think we're basically ready to go from there. If you need uh, just another minute Please let me know in the chat, otherwise I'm going to move on. So that's the toning of the canvas stage finished. The next, the next stage is to go, you can grab a, well it's up to you, it can be a square brush or a round brush, it doesn't really matter, but we're going to use that same burnt sienna. I'm using a round brush here, a number four. Oh sorry, this is a number eight. Um, what makes it a round brush is that it's completely symmetrical on all sides. I'm just going to dip it in my linseed oil and wipe it on a rag just to make sure there's no paint left over from last time. And I'm going to get a little bit of a th thicker paint here now, not as thin as this. And this step is basically drawing out your proportions. This is, this is where you want to kind of work out the shapes and figure out your proportions before you start putting down color. So um, this is our reference material. We're not trying to duplicate it. We're not trying to make it exact, but generally speaking, we want to get the shapes right. So let's take another look at the reference. This of course is a tulip. You can pay, uh, make a special note of the bend in the stem here. Okay, we're gonna have to make sure we get that. That's gonna be essential to the overall shape to have that stem bending, okay? And we see how many petals, distinct petals, one. It's kind of a, in a profile view, comes all the way down to the stem, comes up here and ends in a point. And there's this concave, convex, like an S shape. 
then you have the main pedal that stretches from here all the way across to here. And it's pretty much the same tone all the way down. We might uh, round it off a little bit more than it is here. There's a third pedal back here. It looks like it might be uh, two different ones, but it's actually not. So this is a third pedal. And then there's a fourth pedal. This is quite a complicated shape because you can see both the underside of the pedal and, and the top. So it's coming over like this and then even rounds at the, at, the, uh, at the end. So you're looking at it sort of like this. You're seeing the underside here and the top. Okay, and then, and then here's the fifth one and you're seeing the top of it like this coming toward us a little bit. That's further back than that. We'll make that. Uh, so that's the five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So let's um, let's figure out the major shape first. The major shape I see is kind of a U shape from here all the way to here and across. Let's get that U shape down first. And then we'll make our adjustment adjustments from there. And that U shape will cover pretty much three of the four, us uh, three of the five. The stem, let's say from here, you're just doing a rough drawing. No details, of course, at this point. Don't, don't worry about tone or anything. You're just looking for the major shapes. Okay, um, one thing you'll notice about your U shape is that it's just a little bit taller on the left side. Not, not much though, I've kind of over, overestimated it a bit. Let's break that down now into, the, uh, into its shapes. One here. This is that main pedal. And you can see I'm doing this, it's almost like a pentagon shape. So there's a little corner here, up, over, and down. Just give you a moment to catch up. Um, yeah, Judy, thanks for the uh, message. Yes, I will be um, uploading the um, entire tutorial. The whole paint class will be uploaded directly to YouTube immediately after the, the session ends. So I think the whole thing will take us about maybe two hours, maybe a little longer, two and a half hours, something like that. But it'll be available immediately after that and, uh, and forevermore. Yeah, it'll be available on YouTube. YouTube live. Uh, thanks for thanks for stopping by. Uh, okay, let's let's uh, get this pedal in now. So you see, kind of there's a point. Maybe I just get a little more uh, paint. So I'm just drawing right now. I'm not painting. Just trying to figure out the proportions. So we have we have it up at a point, and then yeah, there's that S shape. So we're going to that side of the S and then down. Thank you, Judy. Yeah, you too. Thanks for dropping by. So there's the S. And on this side, pretty much just straight up. Okay, there's not much more to this one. You see there's a main kind of center line. We can it's a little bit more to the right than you would expect. And it goes all the way down to the stem. I just noticed there's just this little, there's a little bit of a pedal here. That's probably part of this one. It's like a split pedal situation like, like this one has. Uh, okay. So let's let's worry about this shape. So we go, there's a V shape here and then another little V here. Let's let's have that reflected here. And then this one comes down. This comes all the way out. And it's rounded off there.
Okay. Can you do a, now that you have that pedal there, I'm just, here, I'm just gonna rub this out with my finger just cause I don't want that line there anymore. Or that one. All right. Uh, this, this pedal here is gonna be a little more complicated. Well, let's try to break, that, break it down by its basic shapes. So I can see this, let's worry about the exterior shapes first. There's one curve like this and then this is pretty much two curves. When you look at the exterior shapes of an object, those are called the primary contours. And the interior shapes, like this one, that's called a secondary contour. Both are important, but the primary contours are more important because they separate the figure from the ground. So let's, uh, let's worry about this, you, this uh, cur major curve here first all the way down to the stem. And then up, I'm kind of running out of room, so I might have to shorten that. Um, and then, there's that secondary contour here. Let's get the primary contour down. And then the secondary contour, I'm having to shorten it a little bit for just for, because the whole thing's just a bit too big. But this is the time to make adjustments. I'm gonna get my, uh, my rag and just redo that curve. I was painting it by looking through my phone and I didn't realize how off it was until I took a, a look at the real thing. Okay, that's the beauty of oil paint. If you don't like what you did, you can just wipe it off. Okay, and now this last one, looking at basically a U-shape here. Okay, now that all of the primary contours are down, Let's have a look and see if there are any important additional secondary contours that really need to be worried about. It's, there's a lot going on down here. Let's just make sure everything's good. Um, I see that this, this line actually meets at the base of the stem. So let's get that down right. There we go. Um, not too many secondary contours here. Maybe if we can reflect this. And then the middle of this one too. Okay, I'll just give you a, a minute to catch up. talk about the rest of the palette. So what I'm thinking about doing uh, for the color scheme, maybe we're gonna do blues for the uh, main part of the tulip and then some reds and oranges for the stripes. So um, this particular kind of tulip is, is the, the species of tulip is, is, is called a Semper Augustus tulip, colloquially known as the Viceroy. And um, this was a really important tulip in the 1600s in the Netherlands. Um, here, I'm just going to increase all of these a little bit more while I can tell you that. Th so this tulip was really important in the 1600s in, in the Netherlands. Um, there was uh, 
a speculative market, actually it was the world's first speculative market uh, that surrounded the, um, the growing of these bulbs. At one point, a single bulb of from this tulip, the Semper Augustus, was was selling for as much as a house or as much as uh, an annual salary of a averaged skilled worker at the time. So this was the first um, speculative market, and it was also the world's first bubble market um, because the um, tulip market ended up crashing in uh, the spring of 1636 in the Netherlands. And um, it was a bit of a disaster for um, the investors involved. But uh, yeah, quite an exciting time. The uh, This flower was responsible basically for rejuvenating, reinvigorating the, the whole genre of still lifes that really wasn't in existence before the uh, 1600s. But uh, the Netherlands ended up enjoying quite a... Uh, I'm just gonna pull this line over a little bit more. The uh, the Netherlands ended up enjoying quite an incredible run as being the uh, the premier place for still life uh, painting. The uh, Dutch Golden Age um, they basically went from 16 what 50 up until about 1720 1730 something like that. Really long time. There were three basic. Uh, golden ages or three periods but uh, the the genre of still life uh, came into its own during that time and uh, really has never looked never looked back it's still going strong with not just with painting but with photography and uh, and then now with digital arts and nfts so yeah you have in a large in large part this flower to thank for even the creation of that genre so uh, and and what flower is it? Yeah, let's let's uh, let's get into exactly that. This flower is a tulip, but it's uh, I'm just gonna wipe this off again and, and make it smaller. So this flower is a tulip, but it specifically is a t is a white tulip that has a mutation, and the mutation caused it to grow these um, scarlet, I guess, would be the color, um, stripes. Really beautiful stripes. Um, this tulip nowadays is, is uh, you know, you can just look at it. It's just a tulip for the most part. But uh, but back then, to see this incredibly white, uh, you know, it was this white, beautiful red stripes um, was really something to possess uh, the riches of the day. The, uh, the richest man in the world at the time owned 12 of them. And uh, he was the man that uh, ran a company called the Dutch East India Company that was uh, responsible for a spice monopoly um, trading all over the world. This company, by the way, um, was so large and so powerful, it had its own standing army, and it would basically bully countries into giving them exclusive monopoly rights um, to trade with them. So they, the uh, Dutch East India Company was, at the time, the most, it was the richest company in the world. And by today's standards, to give you an idea about how rich they were, the uh, if you add together the top 20 corporations from today, Google, Apple, Samsung, um, Microsoft, and so on. You add all the top 20 together, uh, Amazon, all of them together is still less than the market cap of the Dutch East India Company, which in today's money is about $20 trillion, with trillion with a T. Uh, that's how successful they were. Anyway, there was a lot going on back then. You don't hear much about that stuff anymore. Yeah, yeah, first corporation, first stock market, first uh, bubble market, speculative market, lots and lots of firsts. And uh, a lot of it because of this little flower here. Okay, let's stop there. Um, we have our drawing done. 
if you don't have your drawing done, you can still make some arrangements and uh, changes as, as we go along. So here's our plan. We're going to go um, blues for the main part of the flower, the part of the flower that would be white. And then for the stripes, because it is the Semper Augustus with the scarlet stripes, we're going to go with oranges and, and uh, reds and oranges basically for the stripes. Um, and you can see some of them here, but we're going to make make up some of them. Part of it is using a reference um, to, to, well, to reference, but part of painting is making something new as well, creating on the go and improvising. So we're going to do that a little bit with our color. Let's go with, um, jump into the blues. I have, you can use any blue you like for this exercise, um, but you will need a, a lighter blue and a darker blue. So if you don't have a darker blue, you can mix your blue with a little bit of black. Or if you don't have black um, and you only have one blue, you could mix your blue with a little bit of white. But anyway, you need two blues, a lighter blue and a darker blue. I'm going to be using these two. Um, this is King's Blue Deep and Thalocyanine Blue. Actually, Thalocyanine Blue Lake. Um, I could have used Ultramarine Blue instead of Thalo Blue. But uh, ultramarine blue is a little bit warmer, and uh, this this I think the temperature matches this one uh, better. This is not quite blue. This is a mixture. This is a blue with uh, titanium white. So anyway, we have the two blues here. We'll be using this one mostly for the highlights. This one for the low lights or shadows, uh, and then a mixture of the two for the midtones. We're gonna go uh, paint the entire uh, tulip or just the two colors and then go with the uh, oranges and yellows and reds for the stripes. So let me just get a couple of these, uh, these two colors down on the palette. This is of course oil paint, but you can be doing this uh, exercise with acrylic paint if you have it, or indeed watercolor or even colored pencil. Uh, but this is, this is oil paint. Um, if you have, if you are going to be doing this exercise with acrylic paint, I would recommend that you mix your acrylic paint with slow dry medium. Slow dry medium will allow your paint to dry uh, more slowly. So you'll have more time with your paint before it dries. And that will just give you more time to blend your colors. And uh, here we go with a phthalo blue, phthalo cyanine blue. You can see how dark that is out of the tube. Just an incredible blue. Um, it's going to, I'm going to put some white down as well. Just in case I end up needing to go lighter than that. Um, for my white, I just use so much white that I often use uh, these, this student grade white, but um, I certainly will for this study instead of using my titanium white from Michael Harding. Okay, so just three colors, titanium white, uh, king's blue deep, and phthalo blue. You can use any brush you like that is Let's say medium, small to medium. I'm going to be using, uh, what is this, a number six? No, it's a number 10. This is a number 10 uh, filbert, but it looks more like a flat brush because the shape is all blown out. I think this uh, brush is on its last legs. Okay, so we have a number 10 filbert. I basically, something flat that you can make, uh, get some broad coverage on will be good. Um, notice that there's some of uh, this sienna down here, which is a reddish brown. That's that's a color that will clash with the blue. The result of that is that the color will be less vibrant because the the brown and the blue are on opposite sides of the color wheel. One's warm and one's cool. Um, that's a bit of a problem if you want to keep your saturation high. So if that's the case, if that's what you want to do, take your rag and wipe off all the oil paint 
inside the flower. Now that you have your drawing down. So um, you don't need to, but if you want to get your color as vibrant as possible, it's something you can do for this step. Um, you don't you don't have to. You don't need extremely blue flowers. I mean, there are no blue tulips anyway, so it doesn't matter. But uh, I like to give my colors every possible chance to uh, to be as vibrant and to stand out. Because we just need the drawing. We don't need all of the paint inside the drawing. Okay, so I just wiped off um, a lot of the excess burnt sienna there. And back to my number 10 filbert. Let's start dark here and see how dark it is when it goes on. We may end up having to darken this up. You can see that this thalo blue is quite transparent. Just getting an equal amount on both sides of the brush. So looking at the reference material, um, everywhere where it's kind of yellow and green, that's where we're gonna go blue. And the rule is for, for creating depth in your paintings, the rule is the darker the value, the farther back it pushes. The lighter the value, the, far, the closer it will be. There are other ways to do depth as well, obviously. There's, um, you know, you can decrease the chroma that will make it recede, increase the chroma or vibrancy that will make it come forward. Um, you can make something recede by putting a soft edge on it or come forward by putting a harder edge on it. There are lots of different ways. Uh, but the, we're going we're gonna to rely heavily on the notion of value here. The value is how light or how dark something is. So this is a low value, middle value, and a very high value. Okay, High value things come forward, low value things push back. Let's use that to our advantage. Look at the whole flower. What is the farthest thing back? Well, there's this little guy up here flower back there. There's this part of the um, this petal. You can just see the back side of it. This is going to be behind too. And then this one here, this lower petal, is behind the back of this one. And this one is behind this one. So what I want to do is I want I want this part this line here darker than than that and then I want this line darker than that that's going to make that appear closer than that and that appear closer than that um, same thing here I want this one to be to push back and this one to come forward same thing here I want this one to be closer to us and that one pushed back. See here, this is closer and that's further back. And this is further back. And then also just here, we have this area that's further back. There's no point in putting in any details right now, but if you have some extra paint on your brush, you can make some indications and end up painting over them afterwards anyway, so it doesn't really matter too much. That comes up. Okay, that's kind of the map of where the major transitions between light and dark go. Now let's look at the whole thing um, with this darkest blue, the part that gets pushed back um, and figure out where we can put it. I think underneath 
this petal, there's going to be almost no light. So let's go, let's go for that. We're going to paint the details back into it after. This is this is fairly vibrant, so we might have to knock down the the chroma afterwards. Um, that's pretty much it for that. Oh, down here too by the stem. This area I want fairly dark because it's not really in the light. The light's coming like this. Okay. And then this one down here, um, the light's coming like this. So a lot of that is, even though, even though it's lower and it's furthest back, it's still in the direct, it's directly facing the light. So um, that's gonna be lighter than you'd think considering how far back it is. Okay, um, let's mix this darkest blue with uh, a little bit of the uh, thalo blue, a little bit with the king's blue. You can see this king's blue has quite a lot of green in it. It's a lot colder than the phthalo. There's also a lot of white in there too. So this is this is basically the next step up. This is a I call it a it's the equivalent of a dark gray. So then we'll need a mid gray and then a light gray and then white. Basically a five tone approach. I'm actually coming out with a video uh, fairly soon here on YouTube with uh, it's called How to Shade. And in that I talk about five tones. And it's a drawing video, it's not a painting video, but yeah, have keep your eye out for that. It's uh, I think I'm gonna be releasing it within the next few days for sure. Just doing some final edits on it now. Uh, okay, let's let's work with this basically dark gray. Um, we can get some details here. Create some lines. Yeah, you can see there's a good amount of green still in there. We're not worrying about the the stripes in the Semper Augustus right now. The orange stripes, we're not, we're not doing that right now. We'll do that after. All the way up the side, this leaf will be pushed back. It will start wrapping around. I want to reflect that change with this darker gray as it wraps around. Also here, because this, I've said leaf before, this petal, um, it's like an M shape, comes in. So we'll just color in the darker part. And then between these two lines, this one is further forward, so that has to be a, bit, a little bit darker so that it recedes. I'm gonna blend this in a little bit more here. It's not a big deal right now if you're not doing any blending in yours because we're gonna be painting over the whole thing anyway. I'm just kind of playing around. Um, couple of lines. No, I don't think we need anything on this lower one. Maybe a little bit darker toward the back. And that's going to reflect the fact that this petal is angled like this. So the part that's darker will be further back and the part that's lighter will be closer to us. This, uh, this leaf here looks like it has a little fold in it. Let's do the underside of this fold. 
with this same color that we have here. Actually, maybe even go a little bit lighter. Let me just wipe my brush off. As soon as I put it down, I realized it would need to be lighter. That's fine. Um, okay, let's go to the next level, which will be our mid, just our mid gray. For the mid gray, we're gonna use just straight King's Blue, as is. Um, so that's gonna be mostly everywhere except the highlights and the highlight adjacent areas. Again, don't worry about the orange lines. We're gonna put those in afterwards. Uh, up here, we do have some lights, some lines. Um, That's all gonna be light, light, a little bit heavier here. This one is closer and that one's further back, so this needs to be lighter. I'm gonna have to lighten that up. Let's do that now so you don't forget. I'm just adding some white to that blue so that it can sit closer to us than that part. Um, yeah, over here, this, this petal is further back. So I'm gonna wipe off my brush. I don't want too much white on that side. I think that's a good petal for just that mid-tone gray. Still using that same number 10 filbert brush. I haven't changed it yet. Um, I won't change it until we get into our, our details. And then we'll go, we'll go for something more like a liner, maybe a round brush. But um, in the early stages, I should, I should mention this. It's a really important aspect of painting that almost every first year university painting professor will tell you. When you're doing an oil painting, you want, to, you want to go from general to specific. And what they mean by that is don't get caught up with details. Um, you, want to, you want to just lock in the major areas, the major uh, chunks of color to start to define the depth and worry about the details after the fact. And one great way not to get caught up doing details is to keep your brushes large. I could even go with a larger brush than this, but um, certainly no smaller. So this um, this petal here is, is very flat right now. I'm just painted the whole thing the same way, with the same color. What I'm gonna have to do is, in order to round it off, I'm gonna have to darken the middle and then lighten the edge. Here. Lighten those edges. The edge there and there, and then in the in the center, it's gonna be a little bit darker. Don't worry about details afterwards. Okay, this one here, I want this leaf, this petal, to be lighter than this petal because it's closer to us. And that's the rule. If the closer stuff gets, gets to be lighter and the stuff that's further away is darker, that's how we're going to create depth. This is closer than that, so this is lighter. And you don't have to make the whole petal lighter, you just that edge, really. This one is quite light. I'm gonna go with that titanium white and a little bit of king's blue. 
it's just it's just such an important rule to get your mind around that lighter things come forward and darker things recede and you're going to use that rule again and again in all of your paintings okay let's take a look at this petal here um, i want to basically round it off so instead of it just being flat like this i kind of want it to round off at the top so how i'm going to do that is is there's going to be the lightest part of the petal will be let me just mark it out here will be white like this and then it's going to be slightly darker above and what that's going to do is make it recede the darker recedes remember so this is the lightest part of the petal and then i'm going to go with a little a little bit of a darker blue. It's actually the same blue, I'm just using less white. King's blue deep. And then I'll blend that in. And the same thing up here. This is too light now, or too uh, too dark, because this this one is closer. So now we need to lighten this part up. Titanium white, because you see this petal is like this. We see this side of it, and then on the right side of the petal, it's already wrapping around. So that's that's going to be darker, and that's going to be lighter. The lighter part's closest. So I'm just going to make it light on this left side, and then that's going to give us the appearance of it wrapping around. Okay, what's going on under here? Let's figure this out now. We've got King's Blue. Um, I'll just start with a mid-tone. It's gonna be lighter at the bottom because it's coming forward, it's coming toward us. Let's go light here. At the bottom. And then as you go back, it's gonna be darker. Even a little bit of this uh, phthalo blue as you get way back there. Okay, let's let's put some of the king's blue into this area here because it isn't uh, it isn't quite as it isn't quite this dark. We want to keep that this line fairly dark. Put a little bit more of this phthalo blue underneath. Okay, now let's take a look at this edge of the petal. It kind of wraps around like this. It's very close to us and it's the, well, it is the closest part of the whole flower to us. So that part is farther away. So we know that this needs to be darker, I'm sorry, lighter. That's darker. This is the lightest part and that needs to be darker. So. If it's, if that section's that color, which it needs to be, because it needs to be in front of that, then this has to be really light. I'm just gonna go with straight white, and see how it looks. Just, um, there's just a lot of calculations, just observation. You know, I think, um, I think it's really important not to just blindly start painting. You can kind of figure these things out if you take the time, you say, okay, I need this to be closer, and that means lighter, and then, oh, but look, this is darker there, so that needs to be lighter here, and so on. And then you can kind of figure out, and using that very basic rule, uh, you'll see what colors things need to be. So we have...
mid blue. And the top here is further back, so it's going to be a little bit darker. And now I'm just going to smooth that out. Okay. Let's go for this big area here. Just a lot of king's blue with white. I want this blue to be slightly darker than that blue, uh, which it is, because, because this petal needs to be behind it. Let's look at the, the two blues here between this one and this one. Which one do you think is closer to us? Yeah, it's this one. So that needs to be lighter. So that's painting. A lot of revisions. Go back into different areas. That's why it's so important not to jump into your uh, details immediately. Because if you have to go back into an area, then you will have wasted all of your time putting details in. Um, okay, making a transition now. This blue uh, is a lot darker than that one, but we wanted that area to be the lightest because it needs to curve around. So let's just try to get a bl blend these in. Using a very, obviously, a very simple palette here, just two blues and a white, but you can see that you can still achieve depth even with an extremely limited palette. And um, I have a, a YouTube video coming out very soon on shading. And in that I talk um, about black and white and um, value studies. Uh, by the way, I uh, would like to say that for those of you who uh, have signed up with to my uh, Patreon. I uh, do appreciate it very much. For uh, just a couple of bucks a month, uh, you can gain access to exclusive content and uh, other things like digital downloads, like wallpapers and um, coloring pages, 20% discounts on everything in my store. And, uh, and also for a few more dollars, then you can get uh, access to the print club where I send you a, a print of a painting that I make every month uh, directly to your home. High quality prints and um, those prints are not available in my store or any other way, only available to uh, my patrons. So uh, yeah, for those of you who, who have uh, signed up, thank you so much. I really do appreciate uh, all of your support. It means a lot. And uh, for those of you who haven't signed up who would like to, it's uh, go to Patreon and uh, just search Mark Liam Smith, same as my YouTube name. And uh, if it's free content that you're after, uh, I also have uh, content on Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. So um, you can check out those uh, various sources of social media as well. So thank you very much. Um, all right, let's just do a little bit more um, work down here. You see that I'd like to make maybe this one. I'm gonna add some more white so it comes forward a bit. This is already getting pretty thick, so when I when I paint with the reds and oranges, I'm gonna have to paint fairly thick paint because it's gonna blend in quite a lot.
I'm just gonna lighten that up now. It's just sitting, it's just being a little too dark for me. Um, and then just, yeah, it's gonna have to be dark, uh, lighter here because it's not coming forward enough. And here too. Okay, um, yeah, we can put the stem in afterwards. We'll figure out what color the stem is going to be. Just uh, take a few moments to touch up your painting. And if there's if there are any lines or anything you want to kind of play with, anything you, you think needs to be pushed backward or pulled forward, um, you can do that now before we start getting into details. I'm just going to add a little bit more of this dark blue down here. Okay, um, yeah, just, just take a moment, have a look at everything. It doesn't obviously have to reference, have to look like the reference. Just uh, in today's exercise, it's what's more important than painting the tulip is, you know, hopefully you've, you've recognized it by now, is I'm trying to, the main lesson for today is this idea of the lighter things come forward and the darker things recede. So more important than painting the tulip is, is that lesson. So that's the one that I really want you to focus on and have a look at oh, different areas, different leaves and relationships. Say what's, what's in front, what's behind. The part that's behind should always be darker and the part that's in front should be lighter. Obviously, if you have a special situation with an intense light, a lighting situation, you know, de depending on the source of light, that rule can change. So you can have things that are behind that are more strongly lit. But that's a light source issue. That's not uh, a molding issue. It's not, it's not about the, the objects themselves. So uh, that is definitely a true uh, thing that you have pushing and pulling the, the lighter areas come forward and the darker areas recede. That's true in all cases. Uh, and also in drawing, not just painting. So I think we're gonna finish there with this blue. And I can put the stem in, I guess. Let's do a single line for the stem, just so it doesn't look super weird. Um, all right. Now, um, you can either go for the background immediately or go straight to the detail. Why don't we put the background in? That may, might be a change. Usually we put the background in right at the very end. Let's just drop the background in. I'm just gonna do a simple background like this. Uh, for your background, you can either go with a black or a Van Dyke brown or let me see. I don't know, something, something darker, something definitely darker. I'm gonna go with, yeah, just burnt sienna and black, I think. So I'll go burnt sienna. Burnt sienna, of course, is a dark brown. And black. Yeah, any black will do. You know, I'm just, this one just grabbed one. This happens to be a black called Schwenningen. I don't know how to pronounce that exactly. That's a Dutch word, Schwenningen black. But you could use Mars black or lamp black. Um, I'm just, just doing the background here. And I'm going to uh, I'm gonna mix those two blacks, to, the, uh, the brown and the black together. I could go with just black, but typically what I do is I like to put a little bit of brown in with the black. And because uh, black is fundamentally a cool color. It has much more cool in it. It has uh, 50% cyan and only 30% magenta. Magenta is a warm color, cyan is a cool color. 
uh, and then the other 20% is yellow, which is kind of right on the line between warm and cool. But so black is fundamentally a cool color, and uh, cool colors tend not to go super well with organic subjects, says the guy who painted a blue flower. Um, so, but certainly not portraits and landscapes. You, typically you want to have siennas, browns, something like that. If you are gonna use black, you can always warm it up a little bit with the brown. This is one thing when you're mixing two colors together is to over mix. You see how many times I go through it? Like, hey, why, why are you doing it so much? That's, that's a standard you should, Kind of like chewing your food. You need to chew it more than you think you need to. Okay. Uh, now, for this part, I'm going to go back to our uh, blue brush. I'm just going to dip it in a little bit of linseed oil, wipe it on a rag. You don't need a completely clean brush for this. You know, it is um, pulling in some of the blues that are already in your brush into this. That's totally fine because you're going to end up hitting the edge anyway. And so uh, there's no need to be a stickler about it. If you did want to, to not touch the edge whatsoever, what, the only choice you have really is to let the paint dry and then mask it with tape. And uh, that's, that's tough. Uh, Time-wise, that's tough, and, and uh, it's just it's just a little study. So, what I'm what I'm going to do is just get close, but I'm not going to touch the edge, and I'm going to do the edges right at the very end. The reason why I do it that way is that I don't pull too much of the blue into the other parts of the painting. comes to backgrounds you you kind of have to make your decision up front whether you know what kind of background you're gonna have sometimes you need to paint your background at the same time as your foreground you can't really just wait until the very end uh, like we're doing here so yes uh, but uh, again I'm gonna keep things fairly loose here this is just a, a study Really warm black here. See that the sienna has warmed it right up. You're going to see brush strokes because you are um, because I've I've I'm using thin paint at this point. I'm putting it on thinly, and it is already watered down with some linseed oil. So when you have that, it's going to you're going to see brush strokes. Um, and also the sienna that we put down at the very beginning is not yet dry. So some of that brown is making its way into our black. It doesn't matter whatsoever because we mixed sienna in with the black up on the palette. So, okay, I'm just gonna paint the edges now. Again, not incredibly important. If you get uh, if you paint into some of the blue, it doesn't matter so much. It actually shows the history of the of the painting. I'm just gonna make my way around the edge. I'm gonna have to do a lesson on edge work. Edge is uh, probably the least understood aspect of painting, how to manipulate edge so that it appears, some things appear to be further back or closer to, to you, how to do a soft edge versus a hard edge. I think a lot of those things would be really valuable to talk about in uh, in future lessons. But, uh, you know, as this is just our third paint class, we have to uh, start with the more basic concepts and 
work our way up to the more complicated ones like uh, edge. So you know, keep in mind today's class is just about a very simple idea, a simple idea of things that are darker recede and things that are lighter come forward. I think, I think if you can just uh, absorb one major idea per class, and then maybe during the week practice that with your own, just a study, you can even do the same study that we're doing here a second time. And, um, you know, it doesn't have to be anything really long, just, just a couple of hours or an hour and a half. And I think you'll see that your painting improves quite dramatically. Just focusing on one key idea per, per week. You know, that seems slow, but it's not. In only half a year, you'd have 26 major ideas um, mastered. And there aren't that many major ideas in painting. So... Just take your time. Don't try to learn all of painting all at once. It can be so overwhelming if you do it that way. It doesn't matter too much. I'm not painting a portrait, so it doesn't have to be exact. Let's do some line work here. All the way around. Okay, I'll just give you a moment to finish yours up. And then we'll move on to the details. I'll just have a little drink here. I've been talking nonstop for about 67 minutes. Let's think about the details now. And what are we going to use for a brush? I think I'm going to go with uh, this number four round brush. Uh, we'll see how that goes. I'm not sure. It might be a little flimsy. Yeah, we'll go with the number four round brush. Okay, um, what do we want to do for the stripes? Let's think about, I want basically orange stripes. Um, that's what I'm thinking. The whole idea of the rose was going to be complementary colors. So it's going to go blue and orange. Um, they can't just go orange stripes because the whole idea is to have depth to the, uh, sorry, I think I said rose, I meant tulip. The whole idea is to have some depth here. Uh, so with the orange, we're going to go start at orange and then we'll go up to yellow or orange yellow, we'll mix them together. For the parts that have that are highlighted, like this part here, this part here, those will be really bright orange, like yellowy orange. And then the parts that are darker, like under here and here, those will be orange going the other way uh, down to red, but not quite to red. It's going to be somewhere between red and orange. It's going to be uh, light red. There's a specific color called cadmium red light that 
here Gamblin makes, I mean, a lot of them make it, but cadmium red light is, is between cadmium orange and cadmium red. So that'll be our darkest color, orange, and then up to, up to yellow, or maybe like an orange yellow in the highlights. We'll see how that goes. It's going to be a little bit tricky because the, I don't want to do too much yellow because the yellow and the blue is going to make green. Um, but the orange and the blue, they're going to make gray because they're nearly complements. So we, um, we'll see how we do. That blue is still obviously extremely wet. It is oil paint after all. So one way to get around that when you're painting is to just put it on thicker, just paint over it, just kind of bully your way through. Um, that's why I'm second guessing this brush because I'm not sure if I can get enough. Maybe, let's start. We'll start with a small brush. If we can't get it, then we'll jump to a larger one. Uh, okay, let's go here first. No particular reason, just we see the stripes have come this way around and then down there. Okay, so this is on a fairly light part of the tulip, which means that the stripes have to be light. We've already decided that the light stripes are going to be orange and yellow. Because these colors are nearly complements, the orange should be very, very vibrant against this blue. You're going to see uh, an optical effect, basically. The effect is that the colors, when you put complementary colors beside each other, they um, enhance the other one. So the blue is going to make the orange extra orange and uh, optically, and the orange will make the blue extra blue. Uh, it's a really cool effect. It's it's a way to almost cheat your way into a little bit of extra chroma or vibrancy. So uh, here we go. This is our lightest orange. We decided on this, not yellow, but yellow and orange mixed together. And I'm just going to go here all the way Now, when you're painting with antagonistic colors, like orange and blue are, it's very important not to do multiple brush strokes. After every brush stroke, ideally everyone, but sometimes, you know, you get a little bit lazy. But after every brush stroke, you should wipe your brush. You see in this one how much blue I've picked up after that one brush stroke. And so... If I paint another brush stroke, that second one will be ex will be much duller compared to that one. So every every brush stroke, I wipe my brush uh, because the orange and the blue are antagonistic colors. They will self they will an annihilate each other. Um, so I have to be very careful and uh, reload my brush every brush stroke. It requires a certain amount of patience, but the result is worth it. Let's go for, for one up here. All right, I'm going to go this part now. I'm going to flip the brush. I'm not using the part with the blue on it. You have two sides. Depending on how you load your brush, you have two sides. Uh, hi, Colette. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Yeah, we've been going for about 75 minutes now. Um, I'm going to upload this video directly after the live. 
So if you want to practice it later on, you can, or sometime during the week. But um, yeah, I mean, this one's coming together fairly quickly. So uh, I think it'll be, uh, yeah, a reasonably decent or easy exercise for for people. Uh, yeah, let's let's go back. So it, again, I'm, I'm it's it's the cadmium orange and cadmium yellow. The reason why is because we're painting on the lightest part. So it's going to be this color over here too. Um, I'll go all the way across. Stripes are so great for helping you create the illusion of depth. That's why the Semper Augustus tulip is such an incredible subject to paint because they have these stripes. So whatever mistakes you make on in creating the depth, um, those you can cover them up by painting stripes. The brain uh, does wonderful things in that regard to help you out. With uh, and and when you're painting people as well, it's the same thing. If you put them in a, you know, let's say you're painting a man in a suit, make it a striped suit. You'll see how you know it's much more easy to show the form and the shape. I'm gonna go not quite with the direct with the yellow, but a little bit of orange now. Okay. And this it's kind of transition point here. Um, you can see that on this leaf, there's a little fold right there, and I've just sort of demonstrated it here but I'm not really it's not quite uh, I haven't sold it I need to I need to lighten that blue part up there I think I'll put that in before I put in the orange it could be a disaster otherwise look at the white Whoops, I started pulling some of that black in. Okay. Um, that's going to be fine. It's underneath, so I'm going to go with some of the red, the darker. Very, very lightly here. And I'm gonna I'm gonna go with a little bit of that darker red down the main line of this branch of the of the petal. Because it's a little bit um, pushed in. It goes like this. In fact this one needs to be darker too. Okay, let's worry about this one down here. Basically just have stripes that are radiating from that kind of area. Oh, actually I see some stripes under here too. Let's put those in. Uh, that's gonna be red. Let's, we'll just finish this one off first. Um, I just went for two. I probably should have just done one and then wiping my brush off, but uh, I felt it's kind of a, I went, I went my instinct there. I, I kind of felt that it, I had enough to not dirty the brush. Who knows though? It should, yeah. Don't trust the colorblind guy on, uh, when he's talking about instincts with color. I really don't have good instinct with color. I have, uh, and so I had, that's why I had to study theory. I can't trust my eyes. Okay. 
Okay. Let's go to this area here. Because this part of the leaf is for the back, and or not leaf, the petal, this part is for the back, this part's closer. That's gonna be, uh, we're gonna go with a light red. This is gonna be oranges and then yellows. Hopefully that'll bring it kind of in that direction. So let's go with uh, the red first. Okay, and then the oranges next. Probably took that a little too far down. That's okay. And now into the yellow oranges. Just paint over that other one, that's fine. see that by using the yellow orange here and then going to orange and then to red we're creating this illusion of there's a the plane comes out like this um, because the brain wants to interpret things in the simplest way the simplest way is not to understand that line as three different lines a red and orange and a yellow line it's to understand it as one line that happens to be bent in space so we, what we want to do is take advantage of the way that we perceive. And, uh, you know, the brain also, when, you, when it sees lines, it wants to interpret them as straight lines. So that's why when you see an object like this with lines, uh, it looks like the object is bending, but it's not. It, it's it's a, that the lines are bending. But our brains are interpreting those lines as straight lines. And the easiest way is to understand them, uh, the objects, at, like they're bending. It's a funny thing. Okay. Uh, that's going to be done there. And then, oh, and also I should say something about the, the reds and the oranges and stuff. When you have an analogous palette like this, yellow, this is a warm yellow, this is cadmium yellow. There are other yellows that you would use with greens and blues if you wanted to create a cool analogous palette. That would be like cadmium yellow lemon, or cadmium lemon for short, or cadmium chartreuse. Um, but cadmium yellow is a warm yellow. So when you do have um, uh, an arrangement of colors that are all very close on the color wheel, like yellow, orange, and red, and they're all the same temperature, like those are all warm colors, that's an analogous color palette. So they all have to be the same temperature. That's what's really important because, you know, if you had, let's say, uh, orange, yellow, and green, that's that's technically an analogous color palette, but it doesn't quite work because you, green is cool and orange is warm. Um, yeah, you know, that, that's going to present a bit of a problem. Let's turn our attention now to... Well, this is kind of the showstopper, the big one. So let's do this one back here. Um, it's further back, so we want darker stripes. Let's go reds and orange reds. And then this one, we're gonna save for the yellows and orange yellows. Okay, straight to the or uh, red light, cadmium red light. I'm gonna mix it with a little bit of that uh, orange to bring the tone up slightly. And then the stripes are gonna follow the direction of the petal. Let's say, like this, and wipe it off, wipe off the blue excess, and reload. Uh, a trick, you can stick your pinky out and then stick it on the top or anywhere where it's dry. And then that way you can steady your hand. You can you have a pivot point, you can rotate your, your hand. So this petal here, you see, 
I want it to be lightest right there. And that means I want it, I want, I want like more of this light yellow. Just let's say here, here. I want those to be the lightest areas and then by having those areas lightest and then oranges on either side it's gonna make that appear like it's coming forward because again the main lesson for today is that light comes forward and dark recedes I hope I'm saying it enough that it's gonna uh, it'll be easy for you guys to recall and remember the next time you're doing paintings uh, okay here we go that's the lightest, so I'm going to go a little bit darker on both sides. And then the darkest is going to be this red with a little bit of orange right down here. And then maybe let's go a little bit more down here. It's darker. So, I don't know, hopefully I've uh, demonstrated that adequately. And this part here, I'm just going to lighten it up just so it comes forward a bit. There we go. Okay, next we have, um, should we do this one? Okay, let's do this one. Uh, this large stem, this is the center line of the large, uh, and I said stem. I'm saying leaves and stems, I'm saying everything but petal. I'm trying to think ahead while I'm talking. This large petal, and we have the center line down here, and they kind of, it dips in so when I if I had stripes going across I'd have to reflect that dip by having that part darker but I don't think it's going to matter too much so what we do want is the lightest area it's going to be this area let me just let me just stop for a moment I'm going to get A really strong highlight down. I don't have a very strong highlight down right now. I'm gonna put one down. And, uh, I'd like you guys to, if you're painting along with me, I'd like you to, to do that too. Uh, grab a flat brush. It can be a filbert or a square or a bright brush. Uh, and we're gonna go straight with um, titanium white and then just go one stroke all the way up there like that from there to there. And that's gonna be kind of the main highlight. So I'm going to load it up quite thick on one side. Get ready for this main highlight. On and pull it up in one, one stroke. No scrubbing. It's a little bit of a nerve-wracking move, but let's, let's go for it here. Down and pull it up. Okay. It wasn't a total disaster. Let's do the same thing now. A little bit down here. Nice. And anything else? Maybe just one here and on that, on that side. Okay, what that's going to do is, is uh, give our flower a nice focal point. Now that I'm here, I'm just going to drop in one right down. Okay, back to our oranges and reds. Um, so we can see where the highlight is. That's where we want the yellow. So as the line travels through and goes down, it's going to be brightest during uh, at, at this point. So let's go one like that. We'll put a couple down here. All right, that's the yellow. 
Now to the yellow orange. We keep everything fairly bright here. Um, this color has to be darker, has to be lighter than that color. This orange has to be lighter than that orange because this petal is closer to us than that petal. Okay, same rule again. We've been just been hammering it the uh, the entire time. Lighter stuff comes forward, darker stuff recedes. If you follow that rule, it will create depth. So here we have a nice light orange. Drop it in. And let's go, same thing, cadmium orange and cadmium yellow. Just a, a wonderfully uh, saturated, warm yellow orange. Cadmium is uh, is worth, it's a little bit more expensive, but it does last a long time and it's certainly worth it. So if you are thinking about investing in a color, you have a, maybe you have a birthday coming up or something like that, uh, do treat yourself to cadmium yellow or cadmium orange or cadmium red, any of the cadmiums are just amazing. This is orange, it's not as light as that one because the petal rolls over like that. So going with orange. All the way up the top. Okay. And then I'm going to do a couple of lines. This is yellow and orange again. Getting darker toward the bottom. This is that red. It has to be darker than the orange in this petal. This has to be darker than that orange. That's why I've gone to red and down here too. Okay, let's draw a little um, drop, a little water drop here. Um, so the water drop is gonna be dark on, on the sides around Dark on the two sides, don't join it. With the dark color, go a little bit lighter and, uh, and complete the U shape, that lighter color. And now what you're gonna do, the secret is to get your white and you're just gonna shade the side, the right side in this case. Um, okay, back to orange and yellow. Now, the center line is a little, it kind of goes in, right? So now we have permission to use darker oranges. So I'm gonna mix that red with the orange for this center line, because it is supposed to be further back. All the way down. Um, the oranges here on this petal have to be darker than the oranges on this one because this one is closer to us. So I'm going to put these darker ones in here. And now I'll use the lighter oranges that are available uh, over here. Should go all the way down. That's that's a yellow, cadmium yellow and cadmium orange. I'm gonna just mix them 
making some of those lines. You can go thicker if it if you need to. This uh, isn't extremely advised to go into wet paint like this, especially with complementary colors. You typically end up with a very muddy painting, but uh, we're being careful and uh, cleaning the brush regularly here, you can see. So, but uh, this kind of oil painting is a special kind of oil painting called Alla Prima, or wet into wet. It's just uh, exceptionally easy to make your paintings muddy by using the Alla Prima technique. You just have to keep your brush clean or use a whole bunch of brushes. Um, I've never really got in, into using a whole bunch of brushes. It just seems like you know, you're either holding a whole bunch of brushes in one hand, which is kind of awkward, or else you're just always putting brushes down and picking them up. And I don't know, it just, it just hasn't really been my thing. So you can just wipe, wipe your brushes off if you like, or be careful. Pay attention to the, to the lines. We're gonna go right to our darkest red here for this part underneath. And then from the darkest red into the oranges. And you can see how the different colored stripes are already starting to show depth. All right, for the stem, uh, why don't we just make it reds and oranges? Uh, that would be fun. So there's a little shadow here, you see. That's going to be, I'm going to do that with red. It's going to be a darkest color. And then the stem, since the light is coming in just a little bit from the, from the left side, I'm going to make that a little bit orange on the left side. Okay, let's move in. I can carry that orange all the way down the right side. And then get into the more of the yellows and oranges on this, on the left side. Blend that in. Okay, um, let me just see. A little darker there. So uh, I think that's probably a good place to leave it. Uh, if you are inclined to sign your paintings uh, on the front, you, you could do that. I never sign my paintings on the front uh, for the simple reason that I feel like the signature itself has visual weight. And if you spend time composing your image to then stick something in one corner, you're gonna pull the eye in, in a direction that maybe you don't wanna do. So uh, yeah, I always sign the back. Uh, it's a personal preference and these kinds of things come in and out of fashion right now. I don't know where we're at. It's just been something that I've always done. But um, yeah, historically, these things come in and out of fashion. I hope you enjoyed uh, painting this tulip with me. Uh, it has been my pleasure to uh, teach you uh, today. And I don't know what we're going to work with next time. We'll, uh, we'll have to chat about it. Uh, for those of you who have joined my Patreon, thank you so much. Um, there's loads of exclusive content, digital downloads, discounts. We have a print club. If you haven't joined my Patreon and you're interested in it, please check it out at uh, Mark Liam Smith. And uh, otherwise, I have lots of painting and drawing tutorials, not only here on YouTube, but also over on TikTok. Thank you so much. We'll catch you in the next one.